Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the BIPS Roundtable on the topic Disinformation and Influence Operations, a Threat to National Security. Our moderator for today's roundtable is Major General A.N.M. Munruzaman, NDC PSC retired, President of BIPS, and our speakers for today's roundtable are Mr. Shafkat Muni, Ms. Aisha Kabi, and Ms. Umme Salma Tarin. So without any further delay, I would like to request our moderator to carry on the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Lamia. And distinguished participants, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and assalamu alaikum to all of you. It gives me immense pleasure again this morning to welcome you to our monthly roundtable on a key strategic issue. And today, as you have heard, we are talking about disinformation and influence operations, which we consider a threat to national security. Unfortunately, one of our speakers in the panel, Professor Tarin, has fallen sick, so she won't be able to join us. But nevertheless, we have a distinguished panel of speakers today, and they are Ms. Aisha Kabir, who is head of Potawalo English, which is Bangladesh's largest newspaper, and Mr. Shafkat Munir, who heads the Bangladesh Center for Terrorism Research and is a senior fellow at BIPS. You'd all agree with me that we today live in an information age where information is everything. We live, consume, we live to eat and consume information. What has changed dramatically over the last few years is the information space has been overtaken by an inundation of information. The volume of information is such that many of us are unable to distinguish between information and disinformation. What has also made it more complex is that modern technology, the internet, algorithms, AI, everything else has made the business of information extremely complex. We are unable now to distinguish between information and disinformation. And that is a threat not only to an individual, it's a threat to individual, to the society, to the community, and to the state. Many of us fall victim of disinformation without knowing that we are victims of disinformation. Our panelists today will also talk to you about the distinction between disinformation, misinformation, and other terminologies that you need to understand. Equally important is the aspects of influence operation. Influence operations are again conducted at a different level. They can be covert or overt operations primarily by foreign entities or foreign governments. Influence operations are aimed to corrupt, disrupt the decision-making process of the likely victim, which in most cases is large organizations or primarily the state. Influence operations are in fact part of information warfare today. And information warfare can be conducted at different levels with different intentions and different targets. Conducted at some speed and with some techniques, information, disinformation, and influence operations can become lethal. We have experienced disinformation campaigns and influence operations conducted by states, at different spheres of influence, particularly disrupting or confusing decision-making by the electorate during an election, for example, or conduct an influence operation to confuse and disrupt the decision-making process of a state. So all I want to say before I hand over to the panelists is that this is something we have to live by we can no longer take out information from the information space. They will increase, they'll become more complex and compound, 
and influence our lives and all spheres of our activities. So that's why Bibbs chose this topic for this month to discuss because I feel that it is important for all of us to understand these complex issues. We are also now conducting a series of workshops for young students of universities and colleges for them to understand disinformation because we found that one of the primary targets of the disinformation campaigns are the young people of any society and country. And we'll continue to work on the subject as we go on. So with that introduction, I would now like to hand over the floor to our first speaker, who is Ms. Aisha Kabir, editor of Protomalo English. Aisha, you have the floor. Um, thank you and, and good morning. <clears throat> Aslam alaikum, everybody. So, as our, our distinguished moderator was saying, how information is now like one of the most vital items in our life, just as misinformation is, and why this. While this is true at present, I want to go back a few decades to show how, how misinformation or disinformation could be so dangerous and could actually, whether intentionally or unintentionally, become a national threat. I'll go back to 1938. This was nothing to do with warfare. This was nothing to do with um, any military operation. This was a simple, um, you all must be knowing about the novel, H.G. Wells novels, War of the Worlds. And so uh, there was this movie director, Orson Welles, and so many of you must know about this. And he had a radio broadcast of this H.G. Wells novel. And in the broadcast, what he did is he had this fake news bulletins about Martians landing in New Jersey and taking over the world. The problem is when people listen to the radio broadcast, they didn't realize that this was just a play or this was just, you know, uh, drama. And, and they believed it was true. They believed Martians were taking over. Panic spread. And it was total chaos and panic, nationwide hysteria, and it took a long time to calm things down, and Orson Welles would wonder how he's going to live with it the rest of his life. This was just an example how misinformation can be such a security threat, can create such a disruption, but that was unintentional. Nowadays, things, unfortunately, are not so innocuous or simple. <clears throat> so disinformation and influence operations, a threat to national security. Let's come to disinformation first. What is disinformation? It's deliberately misleading or biased information, manipulated narrative of facts, propaganda, fake news, hoaxes, myth, rumors. So that is basically what disinformation is. You can go into a much uh, more detailed discussion, but I'll leave that for later. And coming to influence operations. Influence operations are like an organized attempt to achieve a specific effect among a target audience. It can have multiple actors can conduct influence operations. It can be politicians attempting to win votes. This is at a lower level. It can be governments attempting to win support. And not mm, politicians alone, not governments alone, but with outside support influence. And it can be even activists advocating change. Can not, and it can be maybe not so innocent. It can have menacing motives. It can pose as a national security threat, as we are seeing. So being a media person myself, I see the role of media or the use of media in this particular area, whether it's disinformation, influence operations. Because with the proliferation of social media, and I deliberately using the word proliferation, social media can 
become a perfect tool for influence operations. Information or disinformation can spread faster than ever before, can spread further than ever before, can reach more targeted and non-targeted audience more effectively than ever before. And as this information spreads or disinformation spreads from hand to hand and it sort of spirals out of control, the actual source or the original source is often deliberately concealed or obscured. And uh, that is um, the way it goes. So the problem is, given the national and global circumstances nowadays, or the geopolitical circumstances, the new polarizations which are emerging all over, disinformation, influence operation, have developed a darker side, a more insidious, uh, more harmful, even more evil for want of a better word, an evil side than before. Unaccepted practices are adopted and disinformation is no longer just a simple fake news, no longer just a, a funny radio broadcast, but it is a tantamount to a national security threat, I have to repeat. And this is where the importance of countering disinformation comes and countering negative influence operations becomes vital and very challenging. So social media is a perfect platform for fake news and this can even be run by state actors, non-state actors, outside actors. Even when it's run by state actors or non-state actors, it is often not just a single entity but with outside influence for so many different motives. And um, what happens is social media gives the actors such easy entry to endless channels of influence, opinions, to spread their opinions globally. It's low cost, it's time saving, it's so fast, immediate, you know, it's just spread immediately and it's effective. So whether it's state influence operations or operations run by radical militants, disinformation is a key tool. We see this at a global level in the obvious examples around the world. It's been used in the Russia-Ukraine war in recent times and in so many other examples. And locally, we see it in our politics. Now, would we call this local use of disinformation in our politics actually influence operations per se? It can be because our politics are no longer restricted to local a local game. Given our position, our geostrategic uh, geo position, now everything has become so not only regionalized, but internationalized, globalized. So even when uh, in our politics, these influence operations are being put into use. And this is visually growing stronger, even in our country as the elections grow come national elections come closer it's no longer just the mudslinging game is more but it's taking on much deeper um, deeper meanings deeper manipulations then we see it in the narrative of the militants used as a tool of radicalization that is obviously extremely dangerous we see it in smear campaigns by politicians and that's a part of a bigger game. But just realizing the existence of disinformation, of influence operations, realizing that this is a threat to national security, that it's no longer something to be uh, ignored or sidestepped, that's not enough. There's need to, for counteraction at all levels. Again, as a media person, since we, uh, I'm not a government player, I'm not in the military, I'm not a politician. As a media person, what I see is that media has a role because media is used for such manipulations. Media is used to spread disinformation, to influence opinions. So media can also be used to for a hel uh, healthy and constructive media, can also or must also play a role in countering such dis disinformation in standing up and challenging such um, influence operations 
and to counter the threats, these threats to national security. It's not that the media is involved in any activism or has a role or have has to don the role of activists, no. But media is all about telling the truth, revealing untruths, countering fake news, misinformation, disinformation. So how do we do that? It's easy to say that, oh, we have to counter it. Given that media is not, um, given what tools do media have, what can media do to a limited extent naturally? Some of the tools are simple. Identify fake news by checking the source, verify information, read between the lines, ask the experts. We are not experts on everything. We have to consult. It calls for collaboration. It calls for consultation. We have to clarify the rumors by immediately providing accurate information coming out there. As a journalist, I would say it's our, inf our responsibility to immediately counter the fake news by providing accurate information. When there's false narratives, we have to offer a counter narrative, the truth. Regularly updating information because the information is regularly updated too, perhaps faster than information, perhaps faster than news. It's fake news that gets updated. So to do all of this, we need to increase our media literacy. And I'm not meaning just the first people, media, people in the media, but the general public, every one of us here, every one of the man on the street too. We have to increase our media literacy. It's We can't just be complacent and say, okay, that's for the politicians, that's for the media, because each and every one of us are being affected. And unfortunately, seeing is no longer believing. We have to not just take things with a pinch of salt nowadays, with a handful of salt. It's become sad, but every time we see, read something in the newspapers or see something on television, we always have to question it. But that is how things are, and we just can't let our guard down. We must critically assess, informa assess information. We can have conference and workshops like this one too, where these topics are coming out as <coughs> General Munir was saying it's important also to interact with the youth since they're the driving force in the country around the world. Interact with them, have roundtables like this. We need fact checkers, accurate, good, meaningful fact checkers, effective fact checkers, and we just need to have the smarts. Uh, as I was saying, this collaboration, this training, there's so much to be done. And in all of this, freedom of expression is vital. I say this because when truth is suppressed, it is replaced by untruth, unchallenged untruth. So that's what I have to say for now. Thank you. Thank you, Asha. Especially your ideas about the role of the media is critical in playing disinformation and also in countering disinformation. But what is more important for us to understand as a state is when foreign powers interfere with our information system. And we are aware of foreign information manipulation and interference in various states or CIMI. That those are the aspects that states become vulnerable when they are interfered with foreign entities who interfere with the decision-making of a state. It is particularly important for states to maintain their economic security, also to safeguard national interests in times of conflict. And unless states are aware of the tools that are being used in modern technology, it is impossible for a society, a community, or a state to defend itself. The tools of disinformation and information manipulations are extremely powerful today. And I also understand that the kind of the ecosystem that has been created in the information space gives it a further spin in making it more powerful, more lethal. Just to speak of a very common use technology for everyday use in, that we are familiar with, 
the WhatsApp groups are particularly very, very potent for spreading disinformation. It becomes the echo chamber of disinformation if it can be polluted. And disinformation circulated many times becomes potent information because you start believing disinformation. The states themselves are to be blamed in many cases for spreading disinformation to their own citizens for narrow political gains and motives. And the states who do that in turn start believing in the disinformation. So we are in a very complex information space and to talk more about this, we we'll now have our next panelist, Shafkat Munir. Shafkat, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with all of you here this morning. This is a subject that uh, we at BIPS, we have been working on for quite some time. We started it during the COVID years and it has continued. In this information-driven space which we inhabit right now, um, whether we are in Bangladesh or we are in any other country, understanding how disinformation affects our lives is very important. But I want to begin by uh, doing a bit of, uh, proffering some definitions about uh, what is disinformation, what is misinformation, because it is important for us to distinguish, because we hear these terms quite a bit without sometimes understanding how we differentiate between the various types of um, issues that are out there. So we have misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. So misinformation can be explained as information that is false but not created with the intention of causing harm. Malinformation can be explained as information that is based on reality but used to inflict harm on a person, social group, organization, or a country. The subject that we are tackling today, disinformation, according to one definition, is information that is false and deliberately created to harm a person, social group, organization, or country. It is done intentionally. And that's why disinformation has become such a serious challenge for us. Let me uh, start by saying that disinformation is not new. Perhaps the term that we are using right now is quite new, but in various forms and shapes it has existed for a very long time. Our previous speaker gave an example of 1938, but even if we trace back the history even longer, we would see examples of disinformation existing, but we did not define it as, di as disinformation as such. Closer to home, very recently, we saw the case of Sultan's Dain. Many of you might be aware that when a particularly false claim was created regarding that restaurant, that they're not serving, they're serving dog meat or meat that is not halal, uh, that immediately created a furor and the restaurant, despite its various attempts, has not yet been able to come out of the clouds yet. So it is just an illustration, ladies and gentlemen, that in today's uh, <coughs> information age, when you create a type of disinformation and if you have the tools and means to spread it quickly among the target audience, it catches fire very quickly and it's very difficult to put down that fire. So this is just one case and we just still don't know who is behind it. It could be a rival uh, restaurant entity, it could be someone trying to make mischief, but the fact remains for the victim, which is Sultan's Dine in this case, the damage has been quite severe. But I would urge you to sort of consider it slightly differently, like what happens when a similar type of exercise is carried out with a bit more intensity and to uh, harm things at a national level. For instance, we have a general election coming up in uh, about eight, nine months time and we must be on guard that there would be various types of disinformation populating the information landscape. Some done locally, some perhaps done externally. And that is going to impact voter behavior, voting pattern and so on. So how we protect ourselves, how we guard against those disinformation exercises is something we need to consider. So it is no longer a case where disinformation is basically just something that is just confined to social media, but in the case of Bangladesh and many other countries, it has now become a national security issue. 
There are several examples, for example, instance in Bangladesh of extremist groups trying to create communal disharmony or trying to ferment incidents using dis disinformation. Whether we look at Ramu in 2012 or some of the more recent uh, communal incidents in 2021, there are ample examples of how social media was manipulated to spread disinformation, which led to violence. So while we enact new laws and uh, new legislation to guard our cyberspace or to uh, put more surveillance in place to protect us against these threats, there is a key question that needs to be addressed and that is individual awareness. The chair just mentioned about WhatsApp groups being quite lethal and that's something we have all witnessed that either uh, someone is sharing a picture on Facebook about snowfall in Makkah or uh, the case of Sultan's Dine or lots of other things that routinely get shared via WhatsApp and social media, which even very discerning consumers of information often fall prey to. So I think it's absolutely critical that at an individual level, we also raise our awareness. But at a more fundamental level, I think the key question that we need to also keep in mind is that there needs to be uh, a freedom of speech. Of course, that's very important in any democratic society. But there needs to be uh, a lot of legitimate information also out there. Because in the event of an information vacuum, especially after a particular incident or so on, that is where disinformation really becomes a big challenge. So if there has been a terrorist incident or a large fire hazard or any other incident at national level, it is incumbent upon the agencies to immediately put out the right information so that disinformation doesn't take its place. And we have noticed it time and again in the case of Bangladesh that after a major incident has happened because of the lag that follows, inf right information is not flowing through and therefore disinformation is quickly populating the landscape. And once disinformation is out there in the information space, then even if you put out right information, it takes a long time for it to actually register. The other thing I think we uh, need to also keep in mind is that uh, it's not just states or corporate entities or various vested groups which are using disinformation. We also have examples of terrorist organizations in the case of Bangladesh and other countries who are actually using disinformation quite adeptly to further their cause. And uh, with the number of encrypted uh, applications that are now available, with the number of the proliferation of social media that is in front of us, the challenge is just going to become more grave in the future. We're also entering the brave new world of metaverse. Although it's, uh, there's a lot of debate about what metaverse will look like or how the technology will shape up, but it's an undeniable fact that uh, the new internet that we are going to see, especially after the advent of 5G and 6G mobile technology, is going to be very different from the internet that we have today. But the question that I have before all of you is that are we actually equipped to deal with the challenges that will come with the onset of this new internet? And especially when it comes to disinformation, especially when it comes to the spread of fake news uh, and uh, falsely motivated information, how are we going to deal with that challenge? When we talk about influence operations, uh, disinformation and influence operations often go hand in hand. And again, influence operations is also not something that's absolutely brand new. It has existed in various forms over many years, but it's just that it's a new term that has been given. According to the RAND Corporation's definition of influence operation, the collection of tactical information about an adversary, as well as the dissemination of propaganda in pursuit of a competitive advantage over an opponent. Uh, the examples of influence operations are aplenty, and I think all countries at one point or the other have tried to use influence operations to undermine their adversary. But uh, as we become more integrated in cyberspace, as we become more uh, integrated with information uh, technology, as we have more technology at our uh, disposal, I think the threat of influence operations is also going to increase exponentially. 
it is not just one state undermining another state's uh, sovereignty, but it's also trying to influence outcome in elections, trying to change the political nature of that country, trying to shape the debate in a particular country in a certain manner, which helps the other country. And there are many examples. We hear quite a lot about North Korea. We quite hear quite a lot about other countries as well. But I think if we look at the uh, extent of influence operations, we will see that in every country at some point, uh, it has taken place. How do we protect ourselves against influence operations? Again, uh, we have to go back to the whole issue of the right information being available to the public. Because uh, only when there is an information vacuum, only when the state is not directly communicating with its citizens in a proper manner, or is keeping uh, sending them opaque or untransparent messages, is when we open an opportunity for in foreign influence operations. We also have to uh, increase our social resilience, not just in terms of our ability to deal with uh, dangers and crises, but also to deal with various types of situations that may face us. And again, I go back to the point, and I think it's very important for us to harp on this, that in an election year, we have to be on particular guard against uh, attempts of disinformation and also influence operations. So far in the case of Bangladesh, uh, it is an issue which we are still trying to grapple with. Uh, I don't think we have quite uh, uh, understood the enormity of the challenge, nor have we uh, developed the right tools or the right mechanisms to be in place to deal with this information. And we have uh, various representatives of the government in the room. And I would urge you to consider this, that we have to have a robust national policy to guard against disinformation. Because the number and the extent of the challenge from disinformation and influence operations will only increase in the coming days. I think quite a lot, I have done quite a bit of work on cybersecurity policy in the past few years. And one of the issues that we always used to encounter when talking to uh, state agencies is how do we protect the social media space? Because I think all of you will recognize that social media is a space where disinformation perhaps uh, gets populated the most uh, significantly and within a very short span of time. The tactic that should be used is not to regulate or curtail people's access to social media. That is not the right way. Because social media also has many positive uses. And in a technology and information-driven society, curtailing access is never an answer. But rather, what we really need to do is increase people's awareness, try to take lessons of cyber hygiene and cyber awareness down to the school level, to have very frank conversations with our social media users about what is right, what is wrong, what should be shared, and what not. Every society today has a challenge where people see a social media post and without giving it a second thought, immediately click the share button and very quickly it goes viral. Sultan's Dine is yet another glaring example in front of us. But it also comes from a place of lack of awareness. If we were able to have media campaigns, literacy, media literacy campaigns and awareness campaigns run by the state across various levels of society, about how harmful this is for uh, social cohesion, disinformation as such, or the uh, usage, use of social media to spread disinformation. I think people would be a bit more aware. We saw quite a lot during the pandemic. The kind of disinformation which was spreading and going viral was at times quite ludicrous. For example, anti-vaccine disinformation or disinformation about COVID. Things like saying, uh, coronavirus does not sur survive in the summer heat. I have seen many people in Bangladesh and in India in the early days of COVID uh, actually believing it, that when you have a hot summer day or the, when the temperature reaches a particular uh, mark, COVID will no longer be there. But all of that proved to be false. But we were uh, believing it, thinking that it's actually true because we were inundated with unscientific data supporting that. And even to this day, a lot of people are COVID skeptics based on social media full disinformation. So 
uh, I don't want to uh, spend too much time talking about it because we want to have enough time for question and answer and discussion. But I want to round up by saying that it's, it's a challenge which now reaches all aspects of society. And especially in a country like Bangladesh with a large population, a significant uh, internet user population. We sometimes forget, uh, uh, because we always hear this thing about Bangladesh being a small country, but we sometimes forget that in terms of population numbers, how large we are. If you look at the latest data released by the Election Commission, the people eligible for voting in Bangladesh is nearly 120 million. That is, if I put analogically, or in comparison, that is basically six Australias put together, population-wise or more than the population of Germany, the largest country in Europe, just the voting population alone. Internet user population, ladies and gentlemen, is again, massive. And especially with the, uh, because we often measure internet user population based on broadband data, which is quite erroneous. But if we look at the usage of mobile data, our internet user population increases significantly. So therefore, uh, just think about it this way. The number of people who have access to a mobile phone or a smartphone, which is mobile data or 3G or 4G enabled, are also potential victims of disinformation. So that is the enormity of the challenge before us. And at BIPS, we want to start a discussion. We want to start a debate on this topic, not just at the policy level, but as the president mentioned, also with the youth, also with our students to uh, play our own small part in creating awareness against this major challenge that faces us. Thank you. Thank you, Shafkat. And thanks for bringing out very pertinent points on the challenge that we face today. I will also add to some of the challenges that I see personally. One thing has dramatically changed is the nature, the number, and the type of information actors Previously, we knew information actors like Aisha and journalist and editor. A 12-year-old TikTok player can be as powerful as the editor sitting next to me. Or she can be, she can be completely overtaken by the speed of a TikTok message. So we are now playing a game with a very different nature of the players in the field. So the information actors, the nature, the number has changed dramatically. We have to understand that. The second problem that I see is coming from data. Data is a massively powerful element. I will go back to Shafkat's mentioning about the elections, national elections in any country and ask you to recall the case of Cambridge Analytica, how dangerously it had access to personal data through the Facebook and social media, and then ran a campaign of targeted information or disinformation. So information or disinformation today can be curated to the level of an individual consumer. It can be curated to a group consumer. It can be amplified in, in n number of ways that we have never known before. So therefore, the power of the information or disinformation is as powerful as it can ever be. The only problem is that we are not living up to the extent in which we can build up the defenses. Particularly in countries like Bangladesh, where the awareness is so low. But the tools are many. Tools are not only in the hands of individuals or groups, the tools are also in the hand of the state and the government. And anywhere, the tools can be misused. So we have to be extremely careful. This is a very interesting discussion, so I want you to come in with your opinions and questions. The floor is open. Can I make a comment? Sure. We'll start with Asha. I just was uh, recalling very recently, uh, there was this, uh, we all know about the unfortunate explosion in the Siddiq Bazaar, build, the building in Siddiq Bazaar. 
And when that happened, uh, many of us knew about it immediately. Many of us didn't know about it. And however bad it was, uh, it it wasn't. It didn't create panic. It created yes a sense of tragedy and all. But suddenly, I'm a part of this uh, group. It's called South Asian Women's in Media. We have uh, members from Pakistan, India, all over South Asia. Suddenly, I started getting phone calls after phone calls from all of these journalists from India, particularly saying, has there been a militant attack in Bangladesh? Has there been a militant takeover? Are you all okay? Are you safe? Please call Kushi Kabir, ask how she is. Please call this. I said, and to me, it, it didn't strike me that it was that building. And I said, what are you talking about? And they said, no, we heard there was this huge explosion that the militants are taking over. So I said, no. And uh, somebody called Kushi Kabir. She's another lady, in, um, a woman. They called her and she didn't even know about it. She said, what? What explosion? And so, I mean, she should have known about it. But that's how things are. It just created a panic among, and it was just spreading and spreading. But I have to say, luckily, and it was good, both the media and the authorities, they did, uh, maybe they should have done it faster, but managed to clarify to an extent what the cause of the explosion was, perhaps 100% not 100% accurate, but there was a plausible explanation about accumulated gas and all, and the panic died down. But this is just an uh, in, uh, example of how you know misinformation goes. Thank you, Asha. That's a very recent example, and we, we all know about it. So it's a vivid example of what can go wrong. So the floor is open. Please ask your questions or make your comments. And it's a free-flowing information space. So say anything you want to say. Yes, sir, you have the floor. Okay. Microphone there. Admiral Lawal, you have the floor. This is regarding the role of media, as uh, this Aisha Kabir has mentioned. I will uh, narrate my experience when I was in Sri Lanka, uh, the defense attache in the High Commission, at the height of the civil war. The Gutapaya Raja Pakse, he was the de defense secretary at that time. So he was, uh, you know, the number one target or president or number two like that, uh, prime target of LTT. He was bombed just near to our uh, Bangladesh High Commission. So we heard the blast and then uh, High Commission told me that uh, please uh, try to collect the information. I was going through all my sources, national security advisor, army headquarters, all intelligence agencies, media, total silence. Nobody could say anything, about three, four minutes. Then, you know, there's a very famous uh, LTT uh, media outlet, the Tamil Net. Mm -hmm. So I just uh, clicked on that, and it comes, Gota by escapes blast with a photograph. And it took a day for the government, for the media to, to clarify what has actually happened. And that was given by Tamil Net in just a matter of two minutes. So there I come the you know challenge of media. Uh, you know, media is uh, social media and then your uh, print and uh, electronic media. Online media has some uh, space for reaction. Something has happened. Now you go for fact check. You. Uh, check the facts cnn tried to do and then they were identified with the democrats you know they stopped that now if, if you try to do the fact check it will go in favor of uh, somebody so uh, the speed at which it it, it uh, goes like a wildfire uh, against that uh, you know uh, how do you see that media will be taking up uh, this uh, challenge of uh, uh, facing it, I mean, any fact check. And by the time you have done this, uh, the people have seen it, they have given their comment, and then uh, move to the next issue. Because it is all, we move by the headline. This is one. And to Shabkat Manir, uh, uh, you know, the definition that you have given. Uh, one is a very uh, dangerous development is the deep fakes, yes. which is the uh, artificial intelligence generated, uh, you know, uh, the manipulation of a face swap, like uh, we have three distinguished panels. Uh, they, uh, their video has been taken, 
now uh, shabkat munir would be talking what he has spoken but the with the face swap he will be talking something against uh, you know uh, the whole establishment his entire lecture can be reproduced with the same uh, thing so this has become a very dangerous uh, phenomena how do you put that uh, deep fake uh, in the definition it is uh, is it uh, disinformation or uh, malinformation or uh, you know uh, it's a very confusing thing uh, how to even handle it thank you very much thank you dr choudhury microphone thank you so much uh, i mean the the primary purpose of this very brief intervention is actually to congratulate uh, uh, aisha and uh, shafkat for the excellent uh, presentation it's a hugely technical subject as we are all aware earlier on i was uh, 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 talking to admiral mustafa and others around the table uh, a center that where my daughter works in the marine uh, Sufan Center has done a lot of work on disinformation, and I followed this in much great detail and tremendously uh, uh, technical work. And I recommend uh, uh, those works to all of you. Now, two very quick uh, theoretical points, very broad theoretical points. Now, we've called uh, uh, disinformation and influence operations a threat to national security. Is it not possible that this is also used to advance? Uh, the national security, like we uh, we all know of this. Uh, uh, you give some historical examples. There is this example of Xerxes being led into Salamis uh, by, by the Athenians uh, through disinformation. And uh, the Athenians would see that as advancing their national security rather than uh, 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 limiting it. So that is one. Secondly, the great danger here, of course, we have identified this as a huge problem, disinformation, misinformation. But uh, one of the uh, uh, solutions is empowering the state to legislate on, on these issues. The great danger here is at this point in time, at, uh, in many uh, parts of the world, uh, people, individuals feel. I mean, the concept we spoke about sovereignty, the concept of individual sovereignty is also a, a burgeoning uh, concept now because empowering the state seems to have its disadvantages as well. So, uh, in many cases, information legislation, every piece of information legislation, many perceive as a, as a threat to civil liberty. So, how can we sort of uh, calibrate this? Uh, 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 because this is a, a very, very important question for every community in the world today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Air Vice Marshal Mahmood. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the panelists for giving us a very comprehensive view on misinformation and disinformation. Uh, Misinformation and disinformation, they both are part of national security, as it is written on the uh, I mean, uh, screen. If it is so, then we should also take steps to counter that. So, now, what are the steps? There are many mechanisms. When I will talk in terms of Bangladesh only, uh, one of the, in fact, tools is your think tank. If they keep on, in fact, uh, having conferences like this, then probably many of the misinformation and disinformation can be clearly dealt with. The other mechanism is your media, where the media states the truth or not. Uh, so the problem is misinformation and disinformation. If people lose confidence in the state itself, then probably misinformation and disinformation spread more. And that is where the thread evolves more and more, dangerously and perilously, at the peril of the country itself. Now, for Bangladesh, I personally think that there are a few ministries which have to be strengthened in terms of the advancement in artificial intelligence. And then we are also talking about the mathematical universe because mathematics is itself capable of distorting facts if brought to the surface of reality. Now, there are three ministries. First one, I would say that is the Home Ministry, which needs to have a spokesperson to deal with this kind of misinformation and disinformation. Second, we have the Defense Ministry spokesman, I mean, to I mean, counter uh, the untruth of the statements or narratives which come up from time to time. And third one, I should say that foreign 
ministry must have its spokesperson to deal with the issues which often in fact uh, in the public with the, when they come to the surface are misinterpreted that is the problem that's why we see that people have started losing confidence in the state and having lost it we are seeing growing and growing what you call it minus of misinformation and disinformation finally if we consider it to be a national security threat then we must also have national security council ideally speaking the best place where these things could be countered most effectively is the parliament and unfortunately we do not have a very strong opposition in the parliament to get into engagement of i mean dialects thereby creating a sense of awareness amongst the public as shafkat munir says individual awareness and at the same time to take it to the level where it is treated as a national threat but it is never treated as a national threat at the state level in our country to tell you frankly it is only by talking in the think tanks we will not be able to achieve much because the way the world is advancing so powerfully that in future the technology will dominate the power of an individual states sir just yesterday we we saw in the television the australia so long which was so critically adverse to letting nuclear weapons to step into its own country is now promoting the advancement of nuclear submarines with the help, with the help of united kingdom and the united states just to counter china orcas and there might be an influence of that in the india pacific ocean of this in the coming years thank you very much sir thank you so before i come to you i want to pose a question to asha what is the level of fact checking capacity in bangladesh what are the sources of fact checks and how do, does the media access those fact checking capacity unfortunately very limited because the there are naturally many fact check tools around but uh most of these are very on an international level and uh within our own country very limited our own our fact checking is mostly our sources our actually i mean we are very thorough in our fact checking we do use international there's the various uh apps the various sites and all we do use those but um nationally speaking on a level we ourselves are the fact checkers we ourselves have to verify every single news and i'm taking this opportunity since, since you asked this question uh, also to address something mentioned by rear admiral awal about the media the challenge of the media which is a part of this is that not only do we have to f- uh, check facts thoroughly but when there's any sort of you know sudden sensational news which comes out we have to resist the temptation of breaking news any media house whether it's prothamalo any media house it's very tempting to be the first one to break news because that immediately sends our you know readership high but we have to resist that temptation let the others break the news we have to go first for fact checking in the best ways which we can our own sources and the limited amount of fact checking uh, sources that we have we have to check news resist the temptation of breaking news because especially when reputed newspapers or media houses put the news out there people just take that to be true so there are many 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 instances where other newspapers other houses are always in fact prathamalo has a reputation or this reputation of not going for bre- breaking news but that has given us a reputation of having genuine objective true news and i think um uh, no fake news so that's what it is thank you ambassador shahid you have the floor thank you <clears throat> thank you president well uh, having heard uh, the the speakers and also the president uh, i would just recognize uh, uh, the points made by my person sitting aside me from the defense perspective and i think i'll go along with how he looks at it uh, from the other side in the international air arena as dr iftakhar 
you know, touched a few points. Those were very, very important. My points over here that uh, uh, disinformation and influence, as we, we, we Aisha has been saying about the media, uh, a very re renowned person once was lecturing and said, uh, you people should, should wake up that 90% of the newspaper and the news is all fake. And you must be smart enough to pick up the right news. So don't worry about the 90%. Just ignore them. They don't matter at all. So he was quite you know, strong in making this observation. Which, uh, But today we see, I, I, we, we had, no, she, she left. There's a domestic help. She's a youngish you know, lady. And she's expert in TikTok and preparing all messages and sending to everybody. So just imagine a half literate person can also understand and, and see what's going on all around. So the world exists with too many odd people and you have to learn to live with everybody. Uh, in our country, as he especially uh, specified our own country, we have people who have also very limited ideas about what's happening in the world. So in the morning, if they're unemployed and if there is nothing happening to them, no assurance of what's going to happen in the coming days, he goes to a tea shop, opens, uh, picks up, a, drags a newspaper and reads that this so, such and such organization is corrupt, such and such institution has you know bungled up. So they think is, everything is gospel truth. Now, who owns the media? We didn't talk about those. These people are hitting at each other. They are playing dirty games, so we understand that. Many people, you know, you understand who owns the channel, who owns the newspaper. You want to read it? Read it. Have a glance. Uh, go through it. So don't be too sure about what's happening and whatever you see is, is going to be correct. So the world, this is happening not only in the recent days. Uh, you know, uh, this is a threat to national security. I think we are looking towards a very high standard. Yeah, everything can be a threat to national uh, security. But I think we have experts in the national security arena to handle all these things. Uh, we, you know, if you think that everybody is is a goof, you would not understand what's going on. They understand uh, what is right and what is wrong. You know, even if you say that I'm being accused, nine out of ten people will will look into different different angles. So you not don't be too sure. One, two, three small points I'll make over here. Now, uh, the algorithms that is now become quite you know popular and and gaining strength every day. Uh, it's so much so that. Uh, uh, they have mathematical, as you said about, uh, you know, President Munir mentioned about uh, the, 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 the plenty of data that we collect. This algorithm in no time will, will let's say there is a park, uh, let's say near this area, the, the Shahbuddin Park or Gulshan Park. Uh, what can go wrong in this park? In, they can make an assessment of the last three months or six months and they'll say on this corner, something will go wrong. On that corner, some burglary will trick. Somebody will snatch because the algorithm will make a study and let inform the police authorities. Keep an eye on that corner and these two corners. You know, there's a big, big book fair going on. Something can go wrong in these two corners only. So this, there is a built-in advantage also with this knowledge and information that we are, we are collecting every now and then. You know, you, I, I'm sure we all know. I'm just going to narrate it once again for refreshing your mind. Uh, when Hollywood started all these, you know, interesting movies, we were all, you know, growing up at that time. I'm thinking, uh, you know, someone much younger, I'm the old generation. And we, we were so impressed about each and every movies of the Hollywood. And, uh, and they dominated so much so that we don't hear of, uh, you know, Italian movies or any other country's movies. It's only the Hollywood movies we were. And these movies were depicting the, the, the what is it, uh, you know, uh, all all things that you can get is is from the Americans' idea. Somebody must be sponsoring. I don't want to name over here. I think we are all intelligent to understand. Somebody so somebody sponsors these things. Somebody pays. You have to pay for it, and then you get the the, the results. So it, they they got the result. This is how the the statecrafts operates. And I think Dr. Tagar mentioned it. it's happening from centuries. It's just not that we we just learned it the other day that something is going wrong in our society. So you see, it's it's a very long chapter. I don't want to uh, to continue. I'm sure there will be many other speakers. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We'll now go to Mariam. Mariam lives in Silicon Valley, so you must be able to give us some new ideas. <laughs> Excuse my voice. Uh, 
it said back here. Anyway, uh, I don't know about new ideas, but I want to bring up something that I was taught by a professor a very long time ago, and I thought that that is uh, applicable here. And that is, uh, in this class that I took, it was outside of my master's program, and he talked about the future, machines. At that time, you know, we weren't really into AI. And he told us, I want you to know this term, which is JPS. And we were like, what is JPS? And he's like, that's your future. It stands for jolts per second. And that is the direction that we have been taken in. We, have, we are being rewired. So when we talk about information, disinformation, etc., we have over the decades been rewired to accept different kinds of information. And uh, the more the jolts, the more we need and then the more we want it. Uh, take, for example, an ad for, say, uh, a coffee with, uh, say, cookies or biscuits. Uh, usually, way back when, you had an ad where they moved a scene at a time where you see a family sitting down for, say, a cup of tea, and then they add biscuits to it, and then they say the name of the biscuit, and then they say, this is, you know, buy this biscuit, etc. So you would see the panel, it would pan slowly in the ad. But now you see the biscuit flash at you, you see like, you know, the family is running, they're going to grab the cup of tea, things like that. So this is called jolts. The faster they bombard you with messages, the faster they bombard you with uh, videos, uh, information, uh, photos, etc., the more we want, I mean, I did my master's in psychology, so that's a different thing. But this was about that, that we are psychologically being changed. And we are being wired to accept more and more. And it, it's an overload of information. So you see that, you know, jolted at you and you think, oh, that's right. Yeah, I got to pass it on. And so you pass it on to, you know, others who pass it on to others. So I, I mean, so many points have been addressed here. And thank you so much. I learned a lot. And so I just wanted to add this. Uh, don't forget JPS. Yeah, thank you, Miriam. All right, Zaid. For the benefit of the audience, please introduce yourself. Thank you very much, sir. I'm Dr. Zahid. My current affiliation is American International University, Bangladesh. It's always nice to hear from uh, two of my very uh, adorable speakers, uh, Aisha Kabir Ma'am and uh, Shafkat Munir. Uh, it's good that you mentioned about George, Orwell, George Orwell's book. Uh, recently, I mean, uh, with the same name, War Words, there was a play written by Michelle Brooks. Uh, it, was, uh, it was in New York and Atlantic Council was supporting it. Uh, uh, it's a similar vein. Uh, David Petrius was very uh, was present in the audience, and he was very appreciative of that. Uh, and there are serious research going on in some of the leading UK universities uh, on uh, the narratives of war and how the political agents use that narratives to infuse support, both from the policymakers and also from the people. But but uh, uh, today, uh, as an academic, uh, my my questions rather sort of I'm trying to be as uh, polite and diplomatic in, in framing one of, at least two of my questions. First of all, political parties are allowed for, for creating a narrative. And when they become, when they go into power, they're essentially the regime which is in power. We're talking about national security. At what point do you think an influence operation or disinformation by, uh, for regime security becomes a threat to a national security. So this is my first uh, sort of uh, questions to you. The second one, of course, do you think uh, there is a limit of disinformation? And the reason I ask you is that if there is a fact, underlying fact that exists, then there should be a limit of disinformation. A classic example would be one of my best uh, mentor, leader, supporter, Colin Powell, having a political death after that disinformation, which is now in the academia, known as a disinformation of his fa infamous projection of uh, weapon of weapons of mass destructions, photographs in the UN Security Council. So, 
extrapolating that example, if we see in our country that we have, a, for example, a power treaty with a particular company, MOU, which exists, but we don't know in details, what would be the limit of any disinformation campaign around it? And should we leave those agents who perpetrate that disinformation campaign to the uh, academics to take, as we have, uh, to take them into task in their future academic engagement like we do uh, in any of the political science or international relations. Colin Powell is often mentioned with that infamous um, presentation in the UN Security Council. So these are two thoughts. Uh, once again, uh, very good to hear from you and a belated uh, women's, uh, International women, uh, Women's Day. Greetings to all of you and all the ladies present. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other question before you go back to our panelists for the response? Let me look around the room. All right. I don't think there is any more. So we'll now go back to our panelists to give their replies and comments or any end thoughts. Let's first go to Aisha. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to speak again. Let me go to the last speaker first, which I think also Shafkat can help. But as you were talking about disinformation, the limits of disinformation, for those who are, of us who are advocating information as opposed to disinformation, we, um, it, it's not for us to exactly limit the disinformation, that is uh, difficult, but count effective countering of disinformation and exposure of the actual facts. You're talking about the power treaty. Let me directly name, say, about the Adani tree with Adani, our power treaty with Bangladesh. So there was something very hazy about it. People didn't even know about the treaty, about everything. But I'm very happy to say, like my newspaper itself, we actually had an Indian, our Indian uh, correspondent, who actually exposed, gave the details of the treaty, of uh, and not only of the treaty, but details of the treaty. And we interviewed various journalists in India who were against this whole Adani empire or whatever he was been doing. And so that was very effective. And immediately after those few one, uh, reports after reports, countering the disinformation, immediately things, I mean, immediately there were reactions, there was awareness. So this was just an example of how to deal with information, how to limit information from the side of the media. I'm not talking about from the state side. But at this, having said all of that, this was just an example of the power, but in general, we are at a disadvantage because of the shrinking space of freedom of expression, freedom of the media. We cannot always reveal the truth. We try to, but immediately we know what happens, the reaction. There are not only the Digital Security Act or the other acts, Sometimes you don't need an act or you don't need a law even to suppress the media's voice. So uh, while we're not scared to tell the truth, we want to also live to tell the truth. So we have to be careful. And yeah, it's difficult to li uh, limit disinformation, but we try our best. And it's not the media alone. I think... Um, since I'm answering, I'd also like to mention something which also our Air Vice Marshal Mahmoud mentioned. So in relation to this also, what we need is also a sort of collaboration. Because like when we speak about the government, we are not anti-government. Not everyone in the government is evil. Everyone has good intentions. I mean, a lot, have, a lot of people do have good intentions. What we need is a sort of collaboration between the government, between the military for, or the armed forces, between the civilians, with the media, with the youth. If everyone can collaborate, get together, and counter uh, this whole disinformation min, uh, machinery, this whole uh, negative influence operations, it can be possible, but there has to be an active effort, not just 
thinking about it, not just talking about it at a round table and that's the end. Has to be active efforts to influence, to collaborate, to get together. And there's another thing, um, Ambassador Shahid was mentioning about Hollywood and how they influence. Yes, that's true. And in more recent times, I would come down now to much more powerful is, is Bollywood or the Indian movie industry has become a huge uh, machinery of churning out the narrative of their ideology there. I'm not against it. That's Everybody wants to project their ideology. But Bollywood now has become a huge... Before it was just about song and dance. Everybody would enjoy it. But now it's been taking on much more serious uh, proportions of putting their narrative out there in the nice, sweet coating of their Bollywood dancers and singing. So, yeah, that is a huge uh, place of uh, influence, whether I would call it a part of influence operations or not, I don't know, but that is over there. And um, Mr. Iftikhar Ahmed Chaudhary, you were mentioning about also empowering the state, which is very important also, as long as the state actors, the motive of the state actors is positive, is constructive. We can only hope so. But as I was saying, not everyone is evil in every state and every sector. So that's about, you know, bringing out the best. That's, I guess, what I wanted to say. Thank you, Asha. Okay, Shafkat. Thank you. Uh, and I think some very interesting points have been made. I would start by Admiral Awal's point about deep fake. Deep fake is definitely a major disinformation tool. Absolutely. And uh, when we uh, we have a PowerPoint presentation as well on this, where we look at some of the disinformation tools and some of the technology that has now been brought forth to create deep fakes is so significant that it's almost impossible to tell what is true and what is fake. So again, I think the question of awareness comes to play. Again, I think uh, more tools need to be developed by social media and tech companies so that people can distinguish between what is uh, true and what is fake and deep fake. Uh, it's heartening to see that the tech companies like Meta are actually investing quite a lot of money now to counter disinformation. They have their own disinformation, countering disinformation policy as well. So we need a lot of... Um, work on that for sure. I think uh, at a broader level, just to take a cue from all the comments and questions that have been uh, made, the key question for us is that uh, how do we regulate the information space without curtailing civil liberties? I think that is the main question that we have to consider. And information space cannot operate in a vacuum. Uh, Aisha Ma'am mentioned about uh, the Siddiq Bajar incident and again I would completely agree with her that since there was no clarity in the initial hours as to what happened it fueled a lot of uh, disinformation, it fueled a lot of rumors it fueled a lot of uh, false threats about it being a militant attack and so on and it took quite a bit of time after uh, several messages came in saying that it was an accumulated uh, gas which caused the explosion for people to believe it was not a militant attack and again, I mean, these things have happened before, so we can't really blame the people per se, but we have to have a more well-oiled communication machinery so that as soon as an incident happens, some form of message is out there from the authorities as to what may have caused the incident. Because otherwise, not just in Bangladesh, but even outside Bangladesh, people were speculating as to what happened. The other thing that we need to keep in mind is that... Uh, our consumption of information and information dominating our lives is just going to increase. As more technology comes to the fore, as people have greater access to technology, the challenge will be even greater. And that's why we want to get ahead of the curve and look at it from a national security perspective to make sure that our agencies, our authorities are equipped to deal with this challenge. And again, I want to <coughs> mention the point that we may have the best legislation in place, but that alone is not going to do anything. Awareness building, having honest conversations with people about what is uh, what they need to do, what the state needs to do is what needs to happen. And the challenge of disinformation um, is only going to grow because 
we are going to have greater access to social media. We are going to have greater access to the internet. And no matter how much we try to build awareness, even the most discerning co consumers of information will also share fake news on social media. That is the reality. So the onus is on us on how best we can prepare ourselves. And I think it is the job of uh, think tanks like ours to start this discussion, to start this debate, to help our policy communities deal with the challenge. So this is uh, just one effort as part of that. And we, are, we will continue to revisit this issue time and again. Thank you. Thank you, Shafkat. <coughs> Sorry? <coughs> okay, please. Should be the very last point. We are about to finish. <coughs> you know, uh, the uh, disinformation, by definition, as we have defined, is something which is manipulated, which is manufactured to, uh, you know, distort and all these things. But uh, the malinformation, mm -hmm. that is something which is existing. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, like, uh, we, we have taken the video of uh, the uh, panel that you have spoken. Mm -hmm. It exists. Mm -hmm. Now you manipulate that. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, what has <coughs> happened uh, last year, uh, it became a big row between China and uh, USA, that a, uh, you know, a new, uh, news anchor, uh, they were discussing. So that uh, is there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they were, uh, face swap uh, was done, and they were talking about policies of Chinese Communist right, Party right, and yeah. the uh, US-China uh, uh, relationship, completely, you know, mm -hmm. Chinese narrative. But uh, from a program which was earlier uh, there. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what my uh, query is that, how do you categorize that? Is it a it sort of straddles the area of both malinformation and disinformation. Okay. Thank you. There is nefarious intent, so it, it can be classified as disinformation. All right. Any, uh, sorry. Thank you. We have had some very excellent discussions here today on a topic which is very, very pertinent and important. At the same time, it's slightly technical. But the information that we go back with is that the information space is rapidly expanding. Whether we like it or not, there will be more and more information. And as a matter of fact, there'll be an information inundation that we have to live with. Another fact we have to live with is that the information cycle has changed. Previously, we were quite happy with the 24-hour news cycle. We got the newspaper in the morning, we read the newspaper in the morning, and that's what people like Aisha gave us. No longer. We want information by the hour, we want information by the minute. And that is the change in the news cycle that we all have to live by. And if that is the case, how do you balance between speed and fact-checking? So that is the dilemma we have to live in again. It is also important for us to understand that information will leave. But what is important in information integrity is the crux. We have to have information integrity that we can believe, even by the state. That is something which is again becoming difficult whether we believe the information that is given to us by the state. And when that doesn't happen, then the arena for information becomes even more complex. I'd like to go back to the comment made by the learned ambassador. It is true that disinformation is age old. It has been there for centuries, as long as information existed. But what has changed is the nature of the information space, the complexities of the information space, and the technology that is available either to create information or disinformation. As I mentioned in the beginning, the tools like AI, the algorithms that we use, the social media platforms that we have, proliferations of information actors, where every individual can be an information actor. So the nature of the information space has dramatically changed, and that has made it more complex. In the context of Bangladesh, again, my personal researcher's view is that 
we don't understand the game very well. We understand the game of suppressing information. Suppression of information is counterproductive. It is negative, it is counterproductive. And the actors who suppress information do more harm to themselves than doing any good to the state. In the context of Bangladesh, we need a comprehensive analysis of the modern information space and come up with a national information strategy to provide information and to counter disinformation. And that is the way we can safeguard the information space for our national interest, for our common interest. With those parting remarks, I thank you all very much for being with us today, discussing on a very important topic of the current age. And please join me in thanking our panelists for today, for the information they gave us. So that brings us to the end, and please join us for a cup of coffee outside. Thank you. <laughs>